Hello, this is Mark, reading The Railway Children by E. N. Nesbitt. This is chapter one. The beginning of things. They are not, they were not railway children to begin with. I don't suppose they even thought about railway except as a means of getting into Metanon and the cooks and pantomimes of the gardens and Madame Tussauds. They were just ordinary suburban children. They lived with their father and mother in the ordinary red brick front villa. With coloured glass in the front door, a tile patches that was not. That was called a pool and a bathroom that was hot and cold water. Electric bells, French windows and a great deal of white paint and very modern convenience, as the house agents say. There were three of them. Roberta was the oldest. Of course, mothers never have favourites, but if their mother had a favourite, it might have been Roberta. Next came Peter, who wished to be an engineer when he grew up, and the youngest was Phyllis. It meant extremely well. Mother did not spend all her time in paying duty to dull calls to dull ladies and sitting daily at home waiting for dull ladies to pay calls to her. She was always there, ready to play with the children, ready to read them, help them to do their home lessons. Besides this, she used to write stories for them while they were at school and read them aloud for after tea. She always made up funny pieces of poetry for their birthday and for other great occasions such as the christening new kittens or the furnishing of the doll's house all the time when they all getting over the months. They had three lucky children always had everything they needed. Pretty clothes, good fires, a lovely nursery with heaps of toys and a mother goose wallpaper. They had a kind, a merry nursemaid, a dog who was called James, who was their very own. They always had a father who was just perfect. Never cross, never unjust, and always ready for a game. At least, if any time he was not ready, he always had an excellent reason for it. He explained the reason to the children, so interestingly and funnily, that he felt sure he couldn't help himself. You think that they ought to have been very happy, and so they were, but they did not know how happy till the pretty life in Red Villa was over and done with, and they had to live a very different life indeed. The dreadful change came quite suddenly. Peter had a birthday, his tenth. Among his presents was a model engine, more perfect than you ever have dreamed of. The other presents were full of charm, but the engine was fuller of charm than any of the others were. Its perfectly its charm lasted the full perfection for exactly three days. Then owing either to Peter's experience your experience of Phyllis's good attentions, which they been used been rather pressing, or other some other calls, the engine suddenly went off with a bang. James was surprised and went out and did not come back all day. All those art people who were in the tender were broken to bits, but nothing else was hurt except the poor little engine, a thing as Peter. The others said he cried over it. Well, of course, boys do, of ten do not cry. However terrible the tragedies may be with dog and their lot. He said that his eyes were red because he had a cold. It turned out to be true. But Peter did not know it, but was when he said it. When he said it. The next day he had to go to bed and stay there. Mother began to be afraid he might be sickening for measles. Then suddenly he sat up in bed and said, oh, I hate gruel, oh, I hate barley water, oh, I hate bread and milk, oh, I want to get up and have something real to eat. What would you like? Mother asked. A pigeon pie, said Peter eagerly. A large pigeon pie. A very large one. The mother asked the cook to make a large pigeon pie. Pie was made, and when the pie was made, it was cooked. And when it was cooked, Peter ate some of it. After that, his cold was better. Mother made a piece of pie to amuse him. While the pie was being made, he began by saying what an unfortunate but worthy boy Peter was. Then it went on. He had an engine that he loved with all his heart and soul. He had a wish on earth. He was to keep it whole. On one day, my friends, prepare your minds. I'm coming to the worst. Quite suddenly, a screw went mad. 
and then the boiler burst. With a gloomy face, he picked it up and took it to his mother, though he could not suppose she would make a lover. But those who perish on the line, he did not seem to care. His engine being made to, to him, was him, and all the people there. And now you see the reason why our Peter has been ill. He soothes his soul with pigeon pie. It's gnawing grief to kill. He wraps himself in blankets where, and sleeps in bed till late. Determined at this to overcome his miserable fate. And if his eyes were rather red, his cold must just excuse it. Offer his pie, you may be sure, you never will refuse it. Father had been away in the country for three days. Three to four days, all Peter's hope, hopes for curing of his affectionate engine were now fixed on his father. For father was most wonderfully clever with fingers. He could mend all sorts of things. He often acted as a veterinary surgeon to a wooden rocking horse. Once he saved his life when all human aid was despaired of. The poor creature was given up for lost. Even a carpenter said he didn't see his way to do anything. It was his father who mended the burrow's cradle, where well, no one else could, with a little glue and some bits of wood. A penknife made all the nose art beasts as strong as their pins as ever they were. If not stronger, Peter, with heroic unselfishness, did not say anything about his engine till after father had his dinner, and his late after dinner cigar. The unselfishness was mother's idea, but it was Peter who carried it out, and he did a good deal of patience too. At last, mother said to father, Now, dear, if you're quite rested and quite comfortable, we want to tell you about the great railway incident, and I'll ask your voice. All right, said Peter, fire away. But said father, fly away. But when Peter told a sad tale and fetched what was left of the engine, hmm, said father, when he had looked at the engine over very carefully, the far children held their breaths. Is there no hope? said Peter, in a low and steady voice. Hope? Rather tons of it, said father cheerfully. But if you want something besides hope, a bit of brazing, say, or some first soldier, and a view valve, I think it would be better keep it for a rainy day. In other words, I'll give up a Saturday afternoon to, to it, and you shall all help me. Can girls help to mend Indians? Peter asked stoutly. Of course they can. Girls are just as clever as boys, and don't you forget it. Yeah, how would you like to be an Indian driver, Phil? My face would be always dirty, wouldn't it, said Phyllis, in emphasis turns. I expect I should break something. I should just love it, said Roberta. Do you think I would? I could when I'm grown up, Daddy? Or even a stoke, be, be, or even a stoker? You mean a fireman, said Daddy, pulling the, and twisting at the engine. Well, if you wish it, then you, when you're grown up, you'll see about making your firewoman. I remember when I was a boy, just then there was a knock at the front door. Who on earth, said Father, an Englishman's house is his castle. Of course I do not wish they built semi detached Villas with moats and drawbridges. Ruth, who was a parlourmaid and had red hair, came in and said that two gentlemen wanted to see the master. I showed them into the library, sir, said she. I expect it's a subscription to the vicar's terms memorial, said mother. Or else the choir or the holiday gun. Get rid of them quick, dear. But it doesn't break up our evening, so it didn't need the children's bedtime. But father did not seem to be able to get rid of the gentleman all, at all quickly. I wish we had, we had got a moat and drawbridge, said the brother. Then we didn't want, didn't have, want people. We just pulled up drawbridge. No one else would get in, I expect. Father would have forgotten about it when he was a boy if, if they stayed much longer. Mother tried to make the time pass by telling him a new fairy story about a princess with green eyes. It was difficult because they could hear the voices of father and gentlemen in the library. Father's voice sounded louder and different to the voice he generally used to people who came about testimonies, about testimonies and holiday funds. Then the library bell, bell rang. Everyone heaved a high, brief breath of relief. They're going now, said Phyllis. It's hung, rung to have, to have them shown out. But instead of showing anyone out, Reef showed herself in. And she looked queer, the children thought, Please, madam, 
she said. The master wants you to just step into the study. He looks like dead, mum. I think he's had bad news. You best prepare yourself for the worst. It perhaps is death in the family, or bank busted all. That would do, Ruth, said mother. Gently, you can go. Then the mother went into the library. There was more talking. Then the bell rang again, and Ruth fetched a cab. The children heard boots go out and down the steps. The cab drove away, and the front door shut. The mother came in. Her dear face was white as a lace collar. Her eyes looked very big and shining. Her mouth looked like just a line of pale red. Her lips were thin, but not their proper shape at all. It's bedtime, she said. Ruth, I'll put you to bed. But you promised we could sit up late tonight because father's come home, said Phyllis. Father said, been not called away. On oh, business, said mother. Come, darlings, go at once. They kissed her and went. Roberta lingered to give mother an extra hug and whisper. Isn't bad news, mummy? Was it? Is anyone dead? Or oh, nobody's dead. No, said mother. And then almost seemed to push Roberta away. I can't tell you anything tonight, my pet. Go, dear, go now, so Bertie went. Ruth brushed the girl's hair and helped them to undress. Mother always did this herself. When she had turned down the gas and went and left them, she found Peter still dressed waiting on the stairs. I say, Ruth, what's up? he asked. Don't ask me no questions. I can't tell you no lies, red-headed Ruth replied. You know, sure enough, soon enough. Later that night, Ruth, mother came up and kissed all three children as they lay asleep. Roberta was the only one at whom the kids woke, and she lay mousy still and said nothing. If Arthur doesn't want us to know you've been crying, she said to herself, as she heard through the dark of catching her mother's breath, you won't, don't know, that's all. When they came down to the breakfast the next morning, mother had already gone out. To London, Ruth said, and left them to their breakfast. There's something awfully the matter, said Ruth, breaking his egg. Ruth told me last night we should soon know soon enough. Did you ask her? said Roberta with scorn. Yes, I did, said Peter angrily. If you could go to bed without caring whether Mother was worried or not, I couldn't, so there. I couldn't think we ought to ask the servant things Mother doesn't tell us, said Roberta. That's right, Mrs. Goody Goody, said Peter. Preach away. Why not Goody, said Peter? Dead Phyllis, but I think Bobby's right this time. Oh, of course she's always in his, in her own opinion, said Peter. Oh, don't, said, cried Roberta, putting down her expo. Don't let be hurry to each other. I'm sure some diagramity is happening. Don't let's make it worse. Who said... I would like to be to be known, said Peter. Roberta made an effort and answered. I did suppose, but... Well then, said Peter, triumphantly, before he went to school, he thumped his sister between the shoulders and told her to cheer up. The children came home to one, to one o'clock dinner, but Mother was not there, and she was not there at tea time. It was nearly seven before she came in, looking so ill and tired. The children felt they should not ask any, uh, any questions. She sank into her armchair. Phyllis took the long pins out of her hair, while Roberta took off her gloves, and Peter unfastened her walking boot shoes and fetched her soft, lovely slippers for her. When she had a cup of tea, and Roberta had put her ink de cologne on her poor head at eight, Mother said, Now, my darlings, I want to tell you something. Those men last night did bring very bad news, and the father will be away for some time. I'm worried about it. I'll make you... Well, I want you to help me. I want to make things don't want I not to make things hard on me. As we would, said Roberta, holding Mother's hand against her face. You can't help me very much, said Mother, by being you didn't help me very much, said Mother, by being good and happy, and not quarrelling when I'm away. Roberta and Peter exchanged guilty glances. But I shall have the way a great deal. We don't quarrel indeed. We won't, said everyone, and meant it too. Then Mother went on. I want you not to ask me any questions about this trouble, and not to ask anyone else any questions. Peter cringed and shuffled his boots on the bar carpet. You promised this, won't you, said Mother. I did ask Ruth, said Peter, suddenly. I'm very sorry, but I did. And what did you say? She said, I should know soon enough. Is it necessary for you to know everything about it? 
said his mother. It's about business. You never do you never do understand business, do you? No, said Roberta. It's something to do with the government. The father was in the government office. Yes, said mother. Now it's bedtime, my darlings, and don't you worry. I'll come right in the end. Then don't worry either, mother, said Phyllis. We'll all be as good as coal. Mother sighed and kissed them. We begin being good in the morning. First thing in the morning, said Peter as he went upstairs. Why not now, said Roberta. There's nothing to be good about now, silly, said Peter. We might be, we might, might begin to tell, try to feel good, said Phyllis. And not call, let not call names. Who's calling names, said Peter. Bobby knows right enough that what. When I say silly, it's just the same as if I, I said Bobby. Well, said Roberto. No, I don't mean what don't you mean. I mean, it's just what his father calls it. A germ of endearment. Good night. The children, the girls folded up in their clothes, which were all in the usual neatness. Or was it only way of being good? What they could think of. I say, said Phyllis, snooping out her bread of all. You used to say it was so dull. Nothing happening like in books. Now something has happened. I never wanted things to happen to make Mother happy. Roberta, everything perfectly horrid. Everything continued to be perfectly horrid for some weeks. Mother was really always, was always, nearly always out. Meals were dull and dirty. A tree made what was sent away, and Aunt Emily went came to visit. Aunt Emma was much older than Mother. She was going abroad to be a governess. She was very, very busy getting her clothes ready, and they were very ugly, dingy clothes. She had them always lit, lit, littering about, and the swing so she did well on and on all day, when most of the night. Aunt Emma believed in keeping children in their proper places, and more than the return of compliment. The idea of Aunt Emma's proper place was anywhere where they were not, so they saw very little of her. They preferred the company of the servants, who were more amusing. Cook, if in good temper, would sing comic songs, and the housemaid, having to be if not offended with you, could imitate a hen that lay, has laid an egg, a bottle of champagne being opened, and could moo like two cats fighting. The children, servants never told the children that the bad news was that the gentleman had brought to the, to the father, but they kept hinting that they could tell a great deal if they chose, and this was not comfortable. One day when Peter was made a booby trap over the bathroom door, and it acted beautifully, the roof passed through it, a red-haired parlour maid caught her, him and boxed his ears. I'll come to the end, bad end, she said furiously. You nasty little limp, you. You don't mean your wage. Or go where your precious father's gone. So tell, or so I'll tell you straight. Roberta Peter this to her mother. And next day Ruth was sent away. Then came the time when mother came home and went to bed, stayed there for two days. And the doctor came. The children crept wretchedly about the house and wondered if the world was coming to an end. Mother came down one morning to breakfast, very pale with lines on her face, used not to be there, and she smiled as if she could, as well as she could, and said, Now, my pets, everything is settled. We're going to leave this house and go and live in the country. Like such as Ducky Little White House, I know you love it. Or only week of packing followed, but not just packing clothes, like you're going to the seaside. A packing chairs and tables, covering the tops and sacking, and their legs with straw. All kinds of things are packed. You do not pack when you go to seaside. Crockery, blankets, candlesticks, carpets, bedsteads, saucepans, and even fenders and fire irons. The house was like a furniture warehouse. I think the children enjoyed it very much. Mum was very busy, but not too busy to know, to now to talk to them, read to them. Even to make it a bit of poetry to Phyllis to cheer her up when she fell down with a screwdriver and ran it into her hand. What are you going to pack this, mother? Roberta said, pointing to the beautiful cabinet inlaid with red tortoise shell brass. We can't take everything, said mother. But we seem to be taking all the ugly things, said Roberta. We're going we're taking the useful ones, said mother. We've got to play we've got to play at being poor for a bit, my chicky bee buddy. When all the ugly use of things had been packed up and taken away in a van by men in green brazier aprons, two girls, a mother and Aunt Emma, slept in the two spare rooms where the furniture was all pretty. All their beds had gone. A bed was made up for Peter 
on the drawing room sofa. Oh, why, this is locked, he said, wailing really joyously as mother tucked him up. I like moving. I wish we moved every once a month. Mother laughed. I don't, I don't, she said. Good night, P- Peterkins. As she turned away, Roberta saw her face. She never forgot it. Oh, mother, she whispered all herself as she got in her bed. How brave you are. How I love you. Fancy being brave enough to laugh when you're feeling like that. Next day, the boxes are filled and boxes and more boxes. And late in the afternoon, a cab came to take them to the station. Oh, a man sold them off. They felt that they were seeing her off. And they were all glad of it. But, oh, those poor little foreign children. What is she going to govern? Going to govern us? Whispered at first. I wouldn't be them for anything. At first they enjoyed looking out the window. Then it grew dusk and they grew sleepier and sleepier. And no one knew how long they'd been in the train when he was roused by a woman, by a mother shaking them gently and saying, Wake up, dears. We're here. We're there. They woke up cold and melancholy, stood shivering on the draughty platform. When the baggage was taken out of the train, then the engine puffing and blowing set to work again and dragged the train away, and the children watched the high tail lights of the guard's van disappear into the darkness. This is the first train the children saw on the railway, which was in the time to come so very dear to them. They did not guess how they had grown to love the railway, how soon it would become the centre of their new life. Nor the wonders and changes to bring to them. They shivered and sneezed. They hoped to walk to a new house that would, could, would no, not be long. Peter's nose was cold and he even remembered it had been before. Bertha's hat was crooked. Elastic seemed tighter than usual. Phyllis's shoelaces had come undone. Come, said Mother. We've got to walk. You know, there aren't any cabs here. The watch walk was dark and muddy. The children stumbled. A little on the rough road, and once finished absolutely full, fell in a puddle. I was picked up damp and unhappy. There was no gas lamps on the road, and road was uphill. The cart went on the foot's pace, and they followed the gritty crunch of the wheels. As their wheels' eyes got used to the darkness, they could see the mould of the boxes swaying dimly in front of them. A long gate had to be opened for the cart to pass through, and half the road seemed to go across the fields, and then went downhill. Presently, a great dark, lumpish thing showed over the right. There's the house, said Mother. I wonder why she shut the shutters. Who's she? asked Roberto. A woman engaged to clean the house. The place. I put the furniture straight and get supper. There's a low wall and trees inside. That's the garden, said Mother. It looks like a dripping pan full of black cabbages, said Peter. Cartwood went along by the wall on the wall, round the back to the house where it clattered into a cobblestone yard and stopped at the back door. There was no light in any of the windows. Everyone hammered at the door, but no one came. The man who drove the cart said he expected Mrs. Finley had gone home. You would see the train was that late, said he. But she's got the key, said Mama. What are we to do? Oh, she uh, uh, left them under the doorstep, said the cart man. Folks do ear power, ear power belts. He took the lantern off his cart and sloped. Oh, here it is, right enough, he said. He knocked the door and went in and set his lantern on the table. Got the over a candle, said he. I don't know what, where everything is, Mother spoke rather less cheerfully than usual. He struck a match. There was a candle on the table. He lighted it. By a thin little glimmer, the children saw a bare, large bare kitchen, a stone floor. With no curtains, no heath rug. The kitchen table at home, from home stood in the middle of the room. The tears in one corner, the pots, pans, brooms, and crockery in the other. With no fire, the back grate showed cold, dead ashes. As the cart men turned up to go out, after he put the boxes there for a rustling, scampering sound, they seemed to come from the inside of the walls of the house. Oh, what's that? cried the girls. It's only the rat, said the cart men. He went away and shut the door, and a sudden draught of it blew in a candle. Oh dear, said Phyllis, I wish he didn't come, and she knocked the chair over. Only the rat, said Peter, in the dark. Chapter 2. Peter's Coal Mine What fun, said the mother in the dark, feeling for the matches on the table. How frightened the poor mice are. I don't believe they were rats at all. He struck a match and lighted a candle. Everyone looked at each other. 
by its weakly blinky light. Well, she said, you often wanted something to happen, and now it has. It's quite an adventure, isn't it? I told Mrs. Varney to get her some bread and butter and meat and things to have her supper ready. I suppose she laid it out in the dining room. Let's go and see. The dining room opened out to the kitchen. It looked much darker than the kitchen when he went in with the one candle, because the kitchen was whitewashed. But the dining room was dark, wood from the floor to ceiling. Across the ceiling it was black. There were heavy black beams. There was a muddled haze, maze of dusty furniture. From the old home, where they had lived all their lives, it seemed a very long time ago. Long, well, very long way off, sorry. There were tables, certainly. There were chairs, but there was no supper. Let's look in the other rooms, said her mother. They looked in each room, the same kind of blundering, half arrangement of furniture, the fire irons, the crockery, all sorts of other things on the floor. There was nothing to eat. Even a pantry but a, only a dust, rusty kitchen, a pelican plate with whitening mixed in it. What a horrid old woman, said the mother. She just walked off with the money and got us any, hasn't got us anything to eat at all. There shan't be, we have any supper at all, said Phyllis, Miss May, looking back on the soap dish that cracked Miss Hodson. Oh, yes, my little mother. Only if we unpacking one of those big cases we put in the cellar, Phil. Do you mind where you t- where you're walking to? There, is a dear. Pete, up all the light. The cellar door opened uh, to the kitchen. A five wooden steps could lead down. It, was a, it wasn't a proper cellar at all. Children thought because its ceiling went up as high as the kitchen. A bacon rack hung under its ceiling. There was wood in it. And coal, also the big cases. Peter held the candle all on one side. I remember I tried to open the great packing case. It's very securely nailed. Where's the hammer? asked Peter. Just, that's just it, said Mother. I'm afraid it's inside the box. There's a coal shovel. And where's the coal c- kitchen poker? And there, and with these, she tried to put, get the case open. Let me do it, said Peter, thinking he'd do it better himself. Everyone thinks as he sees. Another person stirring in a fire, or opening a box, or untying a knot in a bit of a stream. You hurt your hands, Mummy, said Roberta. Let me. I wish your father was his, said the face. You'll get it open in two shakes. What it? What are you kicking me for, Bobby? I wasn't, said Roberta. Just then, the first of the long nails in the packing stage, the case began to come out with a scrunch. Then Lave was was risen, and another, till all four stood up, and the long nails in them shining fiercely like iron teeth in the little candlelight. Hurrah! said Mother. There are some candles. The first thing you girls go and light them. You can find some saucers and things. Just drop a little candle grease in the saucer and stick the candle upright in it. How many shall we light? As many as you ever as you like, said Mother Richard gaily. The next thing is to be cheerful. Nobody can be cheerful in the dark, said owls and dormice. So the girls lighted candles. The first the first match flew off and struck to Phyllis's finger. But as the bird said, it was only a little burn and it might have been a Roman martyr. We don't burn whole. She had to live in days when these things were fashionable. Then, when the full dining room was lit, lighted by fourteen candles, Roberta fetched coal and wood and lighted the fire. It's very cold for May, she said, feeling that what a, grown, that what a grown up it, thing it was to say. The firelight and candlelight made the dining room look very different, and now you could see a dark walls wall of wood carved there here and there into little wreaths and loops. The girls hastily tidied the room, with which putting the chairs against the wall, piling the odds and ends into the corner, and partly hiding them with a the big leather armchair that father used to sit on after dinner. Bravo! cried mother, coming in with full, with a tray full of things. It's something like I just put a tablecloth, get a tablecloth for then. The tablecloth with a box and proper lock is open with a key, not a shovel. And when the cloth was spread on the table, a real feast was put, laid out. Everyone was very, very tired. Everyone cheered up at the sight of the funny and delightful supper. There were biscuits and meringue and the plain kind, sardines, preserved ginger, cooking raisins and candied peel and marmalade. What a good thing Aunt Mamma packed all the odds and ends out of the stomach cupboard, said Mother. Now, Phil, don't put the marmalade spoon in among the sardines. I won't, Mother, said Phyllis. 
I'll put it down a moment. The merry biscuits. Let's treat Aunt Aunt Emma's health, said Roberta. Something. What should we have done? She hadn't packed up these things. Here's to Aunt Emma. Toast was drunk in ginger wine and water. Out of willow pattern teacups. Because the glasses could be found. We all felt they'd been a little hard on Aunt Emma. She wasn't a nice, cuddly person like Mother. But after all, she, was, it, it was she for packing up the odds and ends of things to eat. It was Aunt Emma, too, who had aired all the sheets ready, and the men who moved the furniture put bed sheets said, together. So the beds were made, soon made. Good night, chickies, said Mother. Sure you aren't any rats. But I'll leave my door open, and if you a mouse comes, you need only scream. I'll come and tell you exactly what I think of it. Okay, and when she went to her room, and when Roberta woke to hear the little travelling clock chime too, it sounded like a church clock ever so far away. She always thought, and she heard too, Mother still moving about in the room. The next morning, Roberta woke Phyllis by pulling her hair gently, but quite enough for her purpose. Roberta, Phyllis, still almost wholly asleep. Wake up, wake up, said Roberta. We're in a new house, don't you remember? No servants or anything. Let's get up and begin to be useful. We'll just quit down mostly quiet and have everything beautiful. Before Mother gets up, I won't beat her. We'll be dressed as soon as we are. As they dressed gently and quickly, of course, with no water in the room, as when they got down, they washed, as much as they thought was necessary, under the shelf of the pump in the yard. One pump, the other washed. It's splashy but interesting. It's not much fun, they... Much more fun than basin washing, said Roberta. How sparkly the weeds are between the stones and the moss on the roof. Oh, and the flowers. The roof of the back kitchen sloped down quite low. It's made of thatch and the moss on it, house leeks, a stone crop and small flowers, a clump of purple flag flowers at a far corner. This is far, far, far away prettier than Edgecombe Villa, said Phyllis. I wonder what the garden's like. Uh, we, didn't, we mustn't think of the garden yet, said Roberta, with Vernon's energy. Let's go in and begin to work. I let her, lighted the fire, put the kettle on, arranged a copy of her breakfast. He did not find all the right things, but a glass ashtray made an excellent salt cellar, and knew his baking tin, seeing that it could, would do to put bread on, if they had any. When they seemed to do, be nothing more they could do. They went out again in their fresh, bright morning. We're going to the garden now, said Peter, but somehow they couldn't find the garden. Went round the building, round the house, round the house. The yard occupied the back and across it was stables and outbuildings. On the free side of the house stood simply in the field without a yard or garden to divide it from the short, smooth turf. And yet they certainly seen garden wall the night before. It was a hilly country. Down below they could see the line of a railway, a back yawning mouth of a tunnel. The station was out of sight. There was a great bridge with tall arches running across the end of the valley. Never mind the garden, said Peter. Let's go and look at the railway. There might be trains passing. We can see them from here, said Roberta slowly. Let's sit down a bit. They all sat down on a great flat grey stone. They pushed themselves up out of the grass. It was one of many that lay lay about on the hillside. When Mother came out, she looked for them at eight o'clock. He found them deeply asleep and contented. Half warmed bunch. They made an excellent fire and set the kettle on it about half past five. So they let by eight the fire been out for some time. The water boiled away and the bottom was burned out of the kettle. They had not thought of washing the cookery while they set the table. But it doesn't matter. The cups and sauces I mean. Her mother was a fan in her room. I quite forgotten there was one. It's magic. I boiled the water for tea in the saucepan. I forgot a room opened out to the kitchen and in agitation half darkness night before, if the door had been mistaken for a cupboard, it was a little square room. The table was all nicely set out with a joint of coal, roast beef, with bread, butter, cheese and a pie. Pie for breakfast, said Peter, cried Peter. How oh, perfectly ripping. It isn't pigeon pie, said Mother. It's only apple. Well, this is the supper we ought to have had last night. And there was a note from Mrs. Finley. Her brother, father, son-in-law broke his arm and she had to get home early. He'd come in this morning at ten. It's a wonderful breakfast. It's unusual in the day of a cold up a boy. The children said they would rather have it than meat. You see, it's more like dinner than breakfast for us, said Peter, passing plate for more. Because we 
were up early. The day passed in helping mother to unpack and arrange things. Six small legs, quite eight, were running about the, uh, while the owners carried clothes and crockery and all sorts of things, their proper faces. It was not till quite late in the afternoon that mother said, There, how will do today? I'll lie down for an hour, as you do, as fresh as a lark by supper time. They all looked at each other. Each of the three expensive currencies expressed the same fault. Impressive coincidence expressed the same fault. Fault was double and consistent, like the bits of information child's guide to knowledge, or question on an answer. <coughs> question where should we go? Answer to the railway. So to the railway they went. As they, soon as they started for the railway, they saw where the garden had hidden itself. It's right between the stables. It's a high wall round. Oh, mind about the garden now. Oh, never mind about the garden now, quite be but well, told me this morning where it was. I'll keep till tomorrow. Let's go to the railway. The way to the railway was all downhill. Of the smooth, short turf was there. There were fuzzy fizz bushes, and grey and yellow rocks sticking out a kind of peel from the top of a tree. Cake. The way, way ended in a steep run and a wooden fence. There was a railway with shining paint metals and telegraph wires and posts and signals. They all climbed on top of the fence. Then suddenly there was a rumbling sound that made them look around along the line of the right, where the dark mouth of the tunnel opened, itself a face of rocky cliff. Next moment a train rushed out of the tunnel with a shriek and a snort and slid noisily past them. They felt the rush of its passing. A pebbles and lime jumped and rattled under it as it went by. Oh, said Roberta, drawing a long breath. It's like a great dragon tearing by. Do you feel it fan us with its hot wings? I suppose a dragon might look very much like that tunnel from the outside. If it is, Peter said, I never thought we should ever get as near to train as this. It's the most ripping spot. Better than toy engines, isn't it? said Roberta. I'm tired of calling Roberta by her name. I didn't use see why I should, so no one did. Everyone else called her Bobby, and I don't see why I shouldn't. I don't know it's different, said Peter. Oh, it seems odd to see all the train. It's awfully tall, isn't it? We are always been seen and cut in half by platforms, said Peter. I wondered if the train was going to London. Bobby said, London's where the father is. Let's go down to the station and find out, said Peter. So they went. He walked along the edge of the line, and they heard the telephone wires humming over the heads. When they were in the train, it seemed such a little way between post and post. One and after the post seemed to catch up on wires almost more quickly than they count them. But when they have to walk, the post seemed far, far between. But the children got to the station at last. Never before had any of them been at a station set for a purpose of catching trains, perhaps waiting for them. Always with grown-ups and tenants, grown-ups who were not always interested in stations or sets of places which they wished to get away. Never before they passed close enough to the signal box to be able to notice the wires and hear the mysterious ping ping, followed by the most strong, firm clicking of machinery, very sleepers in which the trails lay with blightful paths of travel by, just far enough apart to serve as a stepping stones, a game of foaming torrents hastily organised by Bobby, then to arrive at a station not through the booking office, but a full free booting sort of way, by the sloping end of the platform. This is itself a joy, joy too, a peep into the porter's room, where lamps are, and a Roman railway amulet on the wall, and one pot of half asleep behind the paper. There was a great many crossing lines at the station. Some of them just ran into the yard and stopped short, as only a tired of business, and meant to retire for good. Trucks stood on the wall rails there, and one side was a great heap of coal, not loose heap, such as you see in the coal cellar, but a sort of solid building of coal, with large solid blocks of coal outside, used used just as though they were bricks, and built up like a heap, looked like a picture of the cities, a plain in a Bible size for infants. There was a line of whitewash near the top of the Macaulay wall, where presently Peter lounged out of his room. A twice repeated tingling trill of a gong at the station door, Peter said, How do you do? in his best manner, as he hastened to ask, 
what the white mark was on the coal be for. Tomorrow, Mark, how much coal there be, said the paupers. As we know of it, anyone nicks it. So don't you go off with none of it in your pocket, young gentleman. It seems at the time, but a merry jest. And Peter felt once that Porter was a friendly sort. No nonsense about him. But later the words came back to Peter with a new meaning. And that's a dog barking in the ground. Sorry about that. Have you gone into a farmhouse kitchen on a baking day and seen a great cock or a globe set by the side of eyes? If you have... And if you at a time still not young enough to be interested in something you saw, you remember you found yourself quite unable to resist the temptation to poke your finger into your soft round dough that covered inside the pan like a giant mushroom. And you remember what your finger made a dent in the row. And slow, that slowly, quite surely, a dent disappeared. The dough looked quite the same as did when you touched it. Unless, of course, your hand was extra dirty, in which case, naturally, there will be a little black mark. Well, that was just the sorrow the children had felt a father going away. As a mother being so unhappy, it made a great impression, but the impression did not long, last long. They soon got used to being without father, though they did not forget him. They got used to not being going to school, not seeing being very little or mother, who was now almost all day shut up in her upstairs room, writing, writing, writing. Used to come at well to down tea time, read the stories that she'd written. They were lovely stories. The rocks and the hills and valleys, trees and canal, above all, the railway was so new, so perfectly pleasing, that the resemblance to the old life in the villa grew to that seem almost like a stream. Mother had told them more than once they were quite poor now, but this did not seem to be anything but a way of speaking. Grown up people, even mothers, often made remarks they didn't seem to mean anything in particular, just for the sake of saying something seemingly. It was always enough to eat, they wore the same kind of nice clothes, and always were warm. But in June came three wet days, the rain came down, straight as laces, and there was lances, and it was very, very cold. Nobody could get out, and everybody shivered. They all went up the, to the door of Mother's room, and not, What is it? asked Mother from inside. Mother, said Bobby, why don't you light a fire? I do not know how. Mother said, Oh, my ducky love, you mustn't have fires in June. Cold is so dear, if you're cold. So, have a good romp in the attic. That will warm you. But mother, it only takes much, much, a little coal to make a fire. And more than we can afford, chicky love, said mother cheerfully. Now run away. There's a darling. I'm madly busy. Mother will be busy now, said Pete Phyllis. Whispered to Peter. Peter didn't answer. He shrugged his shoulders. He was thinking. Thought, however, could not look, keep himself from in social face fastenings of a bandit's lair in the attic. Peter was a bandit, of course. Peter was his lieutenant in his band of trusty robbers. In due course, the parent, parent of Phyllis, who was captured, made him for whom a innocent ransom with horse beads was so hastily paid. He all went down to tea, flushed and joyous as any mounting parade, big, brigands. But when Phyllis was going to add jam to bread and butter, his mother said, Jam or butter, dear, not jam and butter. You can't afford the sort of like reckless luxury nowadays. Phyllis finished the slice of bread and butter. In silence, and followed it up by uh, bread and jam. Peter mingled fruit and weak tea. Of the tea, he went back to the attic and he said to his sisters, I have an idea. What's that? Is it? They are playing. I shan't tell you, was Peter's own spectrum rejoinder. Oh, very well, said Bobby. And Phyllis said, Don't then. Girls, said Peter are always so highly tempered. I should like to know what boys are, said Bobby, would find the same. I don't know how about your silly ideas. You know, some day, said Peter, keeping my own temper by that it looked exactly like a miracle. I might, I haven't, I might have told you about it, I mean, only no hardness. I mean, me, let me tell you my idea. But now I have, I don't tell you anything at all, but it's so there. It was indeed some time before he would deduce to say anything, and when he did, it wasn't much. He said, the only reason why I wouldn't tell you, my dear, is going to do is because it may be wrong. I don't want to drag you into it. Don't you do, do it if it's wrong, said Peter. But Bobby, let me do it, he first said. I'm going to go do a wrong if you're going to do it. No, said Peter, rather touched by his devotion. It's a forlorn hope. I'm going to lend it. Going to lead it. 
Oh, I answer you. Let mother ask where I am. You don't blab. You won't. You won't got anything to blab," said Bobby indignantly. "I oh, mean, yes, you have," said Peter, dropping Paul's beans through his fingers. "I trust you to death. You know I'm going to do a long adventure, and some people might think it's wrong. I don't. And if mother asks where I'm, I'm saying playing at mines. What sort of mines? You say mines. You might be, tell us, Peter." Well then, coal mines, don't let your words pass your lips of pain and torture. You don't fret you don't need to fret and says Bobby. I do think you might let us help. If I find a gold coal mine you shall help cart the coal, Peter consented to promise. Keep your secret if you like, suppose. Keep it if you can, said Bobby. I'll keep it all right, you know, said Peter. Why am I out between tea and supper? of an interval time in the most greedily regulated families. This time mother was usually writing of Mrs. Varley had gone home. Two nights after dawning of the Peter's idea, he beckoned the girls mysteriously at twilight hour. Come hither to me, he said. Bring the Roman chariot. Roman chariot is a very old parameter. It's been years in retirement. A loft over the council house. Should not all it works till we gloated it noiselessly. Permit an epic bicycle an answer to the helm as it probably done in the best days follow your dope no cedar said peter i led the way down to the hill towards the station just over the station many rocks are pushed over their heads put through the turf as though they, for though they like children were interested in the railway in a little heap hollow between the three rocks lay a heap of dry brambles and heather peter halted between turned over the brushwood with a swelled scarred boot and said Here's the first coal from St. Peter's mine. You take it home and jar it, punctually and dispatch it. All one is carefully attending. Any shaped lump cut suit regular customers. The shower was full of good coal. When it packed, it had a lot of so be unpacked again, because it was so heavy. It couldn't get up the hill by three children. Not even when Peter the Harris had himself to handle with braces, a furry glossy brace band in one, a pull with all the girls pushed behind. All three, three journeys had been made before the coal from Peter's mind was added to the heap of mother's coal in the cellar. Afterwards, Peter went out alone and came very, and came back very black and mysterious. I've been to my coal mine, he said. Tomorrow morning, we can cut, bring home the black diamonds in the It was a week later that Mrs. Varney remarked to her brother how well this lot, how this lost, lost lot of coal was holding out. Mother hugged herself and each other in the complete wing. Wrinkles in silent laughter. They listened on the stairs. They all had forgotten that now. They had been, ever been in doubt of Peter's mind that whether the coal money was wrong. They made a dreadful night. There came a dreadful night when the coal station master put a pair of sewing shoes on that he had worn at side side of summer holiday. Crept out very quietly to the yard where Solomon Gorara's state of coal was. A whitewashed line round it. He crept out there and waited like a hat by a mouse hole. On top of the heap, some big small and dark scrambling and rattling fervently, fervently around, around the coal. The station master concealed himself in a shed of the brake van and had a little tin chimney and that was labelled GNSR 34576. Turn at once to the white heather sidings. In this concealment, he lurked to a small thing on top of the heap, ceased to scramble, rattled, came to the edge of the heap, cautiously let itself down and lifted something after it. Then the arm of the station muscle was raised, a hand of the station muscle fell on the collar. That was Peter's firmly held by the jacket with an old cobbler's bag full of coal in his crunch. So I caught your eye, so I, you young thief. To the fat station master. What are the thief said Peter, as he phoned me as he could. I'm a coal miner. Tell that to the Marines, said the station master. It wouldn't just it should be just as true whenever I told it to well, whoever I told it to, said Peter. You're right there, said the man who helped it help him. Stow all you draw, you ring whip. Come along to the station. Oh no, no, cried the dark in darkness. Agonized voice that was not Peter's. Not the police station, said the other fellows. My daughters. Not yet, said the children, first master. The railway station first. Why? It's a regular game. 
Are you more of you? Oh, yes, said Bobby and Phyllis, coming out of the shadow of a cut another track labelled Steadily Colliery, and bearing on it the legend of white chalk bonded in number one road. What do you what do you mean by spying on a fellow like us? said Peter angrily. Time someone did spy on you, I think, said the Mercedes Master. Come along to the station. Oh don't, said Bobby. Can't you decide now what you'll do to us? It's an awful just as much as Peter's. We helped to carry the coal away. We know we, where he got it. No, we didn't, said Peter. Oh, yes, we did, said Bobby. We knew all the time. We only pretended we didn't. We just, we didn't just want to humour you. Peter cut with fall. He mined for coal. He struck coal. He went caught, and now he learned that his sisters had humoured honoured him. Humoured him. Don't hold me, he said. I won't run away. The match search your master's loosened Peter's collar, struck a match and looked at them by the flickering light. Your yeah, boy, said he, you are the children from the three chimneys up yonder. So nicely dressed too. Tell me how oh, what made you do such a thing? Haven't you ever been to a church or learned about your cafarium or anything? You ought to know which wicked to steal. He spoke much more gently now, and Peter said, I don't think it was stealing. I thought it was sure it wasn't. I thought they took it from another part of the keep. Perhaps it could be, but in the middle of it, I thought it, I could fairly count it any money. I'd take a thousand years for you to burn up that coal and get to the middle parts. Not quite, but did you do it for a lark or what? Not much lark carting the beastly every stuff up the hill, said Peter indignantly. But why did you, why did you, said Stacey Master's voice, was much kinder now that Peter replied. You know the wet day, well, mother, Said that you're too poor to have a fire. You always had fires when we were cut it was cold. And our mother said, House and don't interrupt you, Bobby, in a whisper. Well, said the station master, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. I'll tell you what I do. I'll look over it this once. But you remember, young gentleman, stealing is stealing, and what mine isn't yours. Whether it's call it mine or whatever you don't. Run along home. So you don't do you mean you're going to do some anything to us? Well, you are a brick, said Peter with refusing. You are a dear, said Bobby. Well, darling, said Phyllis. That's all right, said the station master. And on his, as, as they parted, don't speak to me, said Peter, with a finger on that hill. You are spies and traitors. That's what you are. The girls were too glad to have Peter between them, safe and free, on the way to three chimneys and not to the police station. They didn't too mind much what he said. We did it, say it was us as much as you, said Bobby gently. Well, and it wasn't. I would have come to the same thing in courts with judges, said Peter Phyllis. Don't be snarky, Peter. If you don't, it wasn't our, your fault. Our secrets are so jolly easy to find out. You took, shook his arm, and he stepped to her, and he let her. There's an awful lot of coal in the cellar, anyhow. He went on. Oh, don't, said Bobby. I don't think we ought to be glad, glad about that. I don't think, said Peter, pugging up the spirit. I'm got not all sure even now that money was crying. The girls were quite sure. They also quite sure. He was quite sure. Or however little he cared to own it. You've been listening to chapter one and chapter two of Railway Children.